So today um, we're continuing our series on modular curves and Galois representations. And we're very happy to have a double header today. And the first talk is by Pete Clark, and uh, he'll be speaking about CM torsion on elliptic curves over number fields. Um, and Pete, is it okay for us to, to video this talk? What? Yeah, it's okay. Okay, go ahead. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Drew and, and Rachel, and thanks to everyone for coming. I'll just jump right in. So um, the, the main object here is going to be an elliptic curve E defined over a number field F, and I'm going to be interested in the torsion subgroup of the full mordel Vey group of F rational points on this elliptic curve. Uh, first of all, this torsion subgroup is always finite for instance, by the mordel Vey theorem. Uh, moreover, it's computable. So there, there really are algorithms which are implemented in Sage and Magma, for instance, that if you type in the Weierstrass equation for your elliptic curve over a number field, it will, it will compute the torsion subgroup. So it's, it's always more interesting to kind of set things up as an inverse problem. So rather than just grabbing one elliptic curve and asking what its torsion subgroup uh, turns out to be, can we figure out sort of all the possibilities of elliptic curve, torsion subgroups of elliptic curves over number fields? Well, what does that mean? How do we um, organize it? So the right way to sort of organize this data seems to be by degree of number field. So um, for a positive integer D, I'm going to define these two things. I'm gonna read the first one as Cal T, so Cal T of D is the collection of torsion subgroups of elliptic curves over any and all degree D number fields, technically speaking, up to isomorphism. So Cal T D is a, is a set of finite groups. And T of D is going to be the supremum of the sizes of the torsion subgroups of elliptic curves over degree D number fields. So again, Cal T is a, is a set of groups and T of D, it's, well, you'd like it to be a number, but you sort of, the first question that you have to ask here is that, is it obvious that Cal T is a finite set and or that T of D is, is finite? Uh, and the answer is, it is absolutely not obvious that T of D is finite, but it's true. And that is arguably the great, single greatest result in this entire area. Uh, it's a 1996 theorem of Morel that T of D is finite for all positive integers D. What, again, what does that mean? Morel proved that there is a uniform bound on the size of the torsion subgroup of an elliptic curve over a number field that depends only on the degree of the number field. Okay, so that's that's a big result. And then you think about that and you say, okay, well, for each number field degree, we have a bound on the size of the torsion subgroup. So we have only finitely many possible sizes for the torsion subgroup. And there are only finitely many finite groups up to isomorphism with a given size. And so therefore an equivalent statement would be that Cal T of D is a finite set for all D. And so already on the first slide, we get this very interesting classification problem. For every positive integer D, we would like to compute Cal T of D, the collection of all torsion subgroups of elliptic curves defined over any and all number fields of degree D. So this is a wonderful problem. Um, not too easy. So let me let me just go with some uh, some 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 results in this area. So the story begins with a um, a 1978 uh, very famous work of Barry Mazur. So he computes T of Cal T of one, which is to say he computes all torsion subgroups of elliptic curves over the rational numbers. There are 15 possible groups. The biggest one is Z mod two cross Z mod eight and therefore T of one is 16. We got one value of, of T of D. Then 14 years later, through a combination of work of Kamiani, Kenku, and Momase, they computed uh, Cal T of two, which is to say the complete list of torsion subgroups of elliptic curves over any and all quadratic number fields taken together. The largest size is 24. And the next step takes us nearly to the present day. So this is a result that I believe was first announced in 2016. The preprint appeared last year. At least one of the uh, co-authors is, is present right, right now. So that's, that's exciting. Uh, this, so this Derek Petropolsky, Van Hoy, Morrow, and Zorik Brown, the paper is called sporadic cubic torsion. So they compute Cal T of three. 
uh, and the largest size of the torsion subgroup of any elliptic curve over any cubic number field uh, is 28. And so you look at these things, I mean, you can ask the people, you know, you, you, you could ask David Zorick Brown for his opinion, which would be more valuable than mine, but my understanding is that it would be very, very difficult uh, to continue this list in this way. So, you know, if somebody said, hey, I just computed Cal T of four, I would be very, very excited and pleased. If someone told me that they had just computed Cal T of 10, I'd be pretty skeptical if, if, I'm, if I'm being honest, like that, that seems to be, um, you know, far out of the range of, uh, like maybe I'm wrong, go ahead and compute, you know, Cal T of 10. But it, this is not the sort of thing where it, it is by no means a routine manner to compute even a single value. So um, if we can't compute the, the sets Cal T of D, maybe we can at least uh, sort of get some um, inequalities for, for T of D. Maybe we can get upper and lower bounds on T of D. And so for the first uh, half or a little bit more of my talk, I want to talk about that. So what about what about upper bounds on, again, the largest size of the torsion subgroup of an elliptic curve over a degree D number field? Well, you, you would want to look back at Morel's work. Did he only prove that T of D is finite or did he prove something um, you know, more explicit, he did. And this work was improved by Osterle and Perron. Um, it, I won't go into the details of this. It's, it's often said that their bound is exponential in D, but it, it isn't, it's exponential. The, they give an exponential upper bound on the size of the largest prime power that divides uh, the, the order of a torsion subgroup. And if you think that through, the bound that you get on T of D from that is closer to doubly exponential. So the, there are upper bounds, but they're really, really large. Maybe T of D can be doubly exponential in D. I'm not proving that it can't. Uh, however, that really seems not to be true. There are some reasons to suspect that T of D should be much smaller than exponential in D. Uh, and I want to discuss some of these things. Okay, so uh, the way the game works, at least for me and, and uh, other people around me, is T of D is so hard to compute that to do something, rather than ranging over the class of all elliptic curves defined over all degree D number fields, we will range over some subclass of that and compute the, uh, the largest or get a result on the size of the largest torsion subgroup on elliptic curves over that subclass. And so the first subclass that I want to consider is you range over elliptic curves over all number fields of degree D, but you require the J invariant uh, to lie in, in the rational numbers. So this, this contains the subclass of elliptic curves that can be defined over Q and are then base extended to your uh, degree D number field. I'll call that T sub Q of D. And so here we have a result which is joint with my UGA colleague, Paul Pollock. Uh, the precise shape of it is not so important, but you can see that uh, when you restrict to this subclass, you get what we would call a polynomial bound on D. In particular, T Q of D is big O, of a certain power of D, and we can get using our methods, which build heavily on work of Alvaro Lozano Robledo, we can get any power of D which is uh, bigger than five halves. Okay, and so you know this this suggests maybe. So you see, I'm being careful about this. You don't have to agree with me, but. Perhaps this suggests that we should be looking for polynomial bounds on T of D. So T of D grows uh, no faster than some fixed power of D. I think a lot of people think that that should be the case. And to, to be clear, it is my understanding uh, that this, this, is, this is wide open. That would be a very, very exciting result to get any polynomial bound. Um, you know, uh, what, what power do you think it should be? We'll, we'll get a little some hints towards that a little later in the talk, if, if you believe it. Okay, what about lower bounds though, right? And so in principle, it should be a lot easier to give a lower bound because you just give me an elliptic curve over a degree D number field and you compute its torsion subgroup or you find some torsion points on the elliptic curve and okay, that, that already gives you a lower bound. So that should be easier. There's a very nice lower bound um, due to Florian Breuer uh, from a 2010 paper, which gets cited again and again and again by me and my collaborators over the years. Um, let me sound this out for you a little bit. So, so Florian Breuer's result says there's an absolute positive constant C and an uh, infinite set of Ds along which T of D is bigger than that fixed positive constant times D log log D. 
So not for every D, not for sufficiently large D, but for infinitely many degrees, T of D is at least that large. In particular, Breuer's result says that T of D is not O of D. It is, it is a bit bigger than that infinitely often. Okay, so there's your, there's your lower bound. And as soon as you see this result, you say, okay, well, um, uh, I, I'm very happy to know that the that limb soup is positive. Is, is it also finite, right? If it were finite, then that would tell you that T of D is big O of D log log D, and that would be the best, the best thing that you could say. Okay, and so we really don't know but if you were going to guess anything as to the um, asymptotic upper order of T of D, I think it would be reasonable to guess D log log D. It's the smallest thing you could possibly guess. And um, it, it's kind of plausible, um, I think, based on some results that I'm going to um, reveal later. OK, so now I want to introduce uh, complex multiplication, which is the subclass of curves that I really want to talk about. I didn't want to just introduce complex multiplication from the beginning because for this first part of the talk, my main goal is to kind of show you how the CM case fits in, fits together with the not CM case. Okay, so for elliptic curves over a number field or with mild generalizations over any field of characteristic zero, there's just a simple dichotomy. You either have complex multiplication or you, or you don't. Okay, and so uh, it, in which is which it is depends on the endomorphism ring of the elliptic curve. If you're just seeing this for the first time, I think it's most pleasant to come at this by looking at the elliptic curve over the complex numbers. Okay, technically speaking, if your elliptic curve starts out over a number field F of degree D, there are D different embeddings from F into the complex numbers. And I promise you that this dichotomy does not depend upon which complex embedding you choose. So embed it into the complex numbers, however you like. And then the complex points are a complex analytic Lie group that is isomorphic to C modulo a full lattice, like it's beautiful classical um, Riemann surface stuff. You can read all about it in chapter six of Silverman's first book on elliptic curves, for instance. And why am I doing this? Because it's very, very transparent what the endomorphism ring of the elliptic curve is based on this complex analytic description. The endomorphism ring of the elliptic curve is simply lambda colon lambda, which I had better tell you what that is, and I just did. So lambda colon lambda is just the set of complex numbers that when you multiply them by every element in the lattice, they stay in the lattice, okay? And so even if you're seeing this for the first time, it, it's, it should be reasonably transparent. It's pretty easy to see that lambda colon lambda is a subring of the complex numbers. It's really easy to see that it contains the integers because after all, lambda is an additive subgroup of the complex numbers. So of course, if you take an additive subgroup and you multiply it by any integer, you have to stay inside your additive subgroup. So the endomorphism ring of our complex elliptic curve is a subring of C that contains the integers. And then here comes the, the dichotomy. For most lattices, uh, equality holds. And so for most elliptic curves over the complex numbers, uh, there is not complex multiplication. So for a countably infinite set of isomorphism classes, you do have complex multiplication, which means the endomorphism ring is anything bigger than just the integers. And then it turns out that the, the possibilities are very constrained. The only other thing that the endomorphism ring of an elliptic curve over the complex numbers could be is an order in an imaginary quadratic field. So what does that mean? Well, the maximal order of an imaginary quadratic field is the full ring of integers of, a, of the quadratic field, which is a free rank to um, Z module um, you know, and a ring whose fraction field is, uh, is K. And so for, that's, that's the definition of any imaginary quadratic order. It should be a subring of K that is free of rank two as a Z module and whose fraction field is K. And it turns out that every order sits as a finite index subring uh, inside the maximal order, which is the ring of integer. So it's a slightly smaller ring of integral elements. Okay, and then by the way, it, it's also easy to see that O colon O is equal to O. And what does that mean? It means that the endomorphism ring of C modulo O in particular, uh, is going to be um, an elliptic curve that has complex multiplication by the endomorphism ring O. So in other words, we know exactly what the endomorphism rings of CM elliptic curves are. They are all possible imaginary quadratic orders. 
Okay, so now I want to re reorient towards the CM case. And so I'm just, if I do a sub TM on anything, even if I had a Cal T, which I haven't written here, but I'll be considering that later, it just means like T of D, so restrict the complex multiplication. This, so TCM of D is the largest size of the torsion subgroup of an elliptic curve defined over a degree D number field with complex multiplication. But again, because we just introduced this dichotomy, because every elliptic curve either has complex multiplication or it doesn't, if I'm restricting to the CM case, it looks a little funny, but why don't I also restrict to the not CM case? Okay, so T not CM of D is like T of D only, in, or like TCM of D, only instead of requiring complex multiplication, I'm prohibiting complex multiplication. Okay, and so I, I, I hope that at least this is clear because it's a dichotomy, the absolute largest size of the torsion subgroup of an elliptic curve over a degree D number field either arises from an elliptic curve with complex multiplication or it arises from an elliptic curve without complex multiplication or both. I, I went through this like five times before I was like, yeah, it, it, could, it could actually be both. It seems like, it seems like it's one or the other uh, most of the time as you'll, as you'll see later, but. Anyway, this, this statement is still true. And it's interesting to ask, do we think that T of D is going to be attained by a CM elliptic curve or by a non-CM elliptic curve or, okay, you know, maybe both. So that's a great question. The, the answer to that question is um, strongly limited by the fact that unfortunately we only know the first three values of, of T of D. Uh, right now. We know lots more values of TCM of D and the work that I'll describe in the end should, should allow us to compute let's say all of them, uh, but we definitely know the first 15 values of TCM of D. Uh, we know all the odd values of TCM of D due to work of Bourdon and Pollock. So the side, but at the moment, the direct side-by-side -side comparison is a little bit limited. So you see that TCM of one is six, that's due to Lauren Olson from the 70s. TCM of two is 12, TCM of three is 14. And now I just told you that regular old T of one or regular old T of D was 16, then 24, then 28. And just the very fact that the TCM of D is strictly smaller than T of D forces T of D to be T not CM of D only when D is equal to one, two, and three. So for these three values, it's kind of looking like TCM of D is smaller than T of D. It, it's not really definitive though, it's only three values. Again, I've stared at these slides enough times that I keep noticing that 12 is half of 24 and 14 is half of 28. Surely that it means nothing, you know, if you extend the list, but I don't know, I'm only looking at a list of uh, three things. So, um, never, so I wanna say more, I can say a lot more asymptotically on the TCM of D side, and I'm going to, and then I can say some really sketchy things on the T not CM of D side, and I'll do that too. Okay, so the philosophy of the CM case is, um, it's it seems to be extremal in some ways. Uh, so in other words, if you're trying to maximize something or minimize something, uh, often the, the, the extreme value is going to occur with the CM elliptic curve. Uh, and then in other ways, it's, it's really exceptional. So for instance, if you were studying the Galois representations, as Jeremy is going to do uh, in his talk, pretty sure he's going to exclude this, the CM case for, uh, for, for most of what he's doing because the Galois representation is wildly, wildly different uh, in, the, in the CM case. Okay, and so um, surely we should be interested in the general case, you know, CM or not. But the idea is that it doesn't usually work that way. If you're trying to study the general case, a lot of times in practice, you, you study the CM case separately and then you study the not CM case. And so uh, I thought I saw this even in the talks two weeks ago uh, that Aiken, Osman, and Laurie Watson gave. So they had some classification results and they're like, here's the CM stuff and here's, here's the not CM stuff. So yeah, we're, we're, we're most interested in the general case. The non-CM case is much more difficult than the CM case, um, but you gotta do the CM case anyway and the interaction between the two is very interesting. So here in this slide, I'm just slap this, this came up, I think, in Laurie's talk last time. I'm just slapping up a recent result, um, which is kind of easy to state using the terminology that she introduced. Uh, this is due to myself, my two students, Tyler Janow, Freddie Saya, and my colleague, Paul Pollock. Um, yeah, so 
for all but finitely many uh, positive integers m and n, and we have an explicit finite list of possible exceptions, these modular curves have sporadic CM points. Okay, so it's really two families. I'll, I'll talk about this, this x1 of m comma n is parameterizing z mod m cross z mod n uh, torsion structures on uh, elliptic curves. So if you take m equals n, you get x of n. If you take m equals one, you get x1 of n. So this third family is really like a generalization of the second family. But so in other words, there's just, there are sporadic CM points on modular curves in abundance. How many non-CM, non-cuspidal sporadic points are there on modular curves? Well, very few of them uh, have, have been found. Okay, so that sort of points to, I mean, I'll just say it. I mean, you, you would have to believe that maybe for almost all modular curves or for most modular curves, the least degree of a non-cuspidal point on these modular curves is probably going to be a CM point. I can't prove that, but I can certainly find CM points of much smaller degree than people can find. Okay. So that's a sense in which the CM case is extremal. Okay, so then I, I had a lot more fluff, which I cut for time. And so uh, that this is fine because this, this is my single favorite result. Um, on, on complex multiplication. So this is the sharp, sharp upper order result for uh, TCM of D. Okay, yeah, and so what, what is this saying? This is saying that um, TCM of D can be as large as a constant times D log log D infinitely often. It can be no larger. So we proved that we proved in 2014, Paul Pollock and I proved that this limb soup was finite and non-zero. And even that result I would describe as saying the upper order of TCM of D is D log log D, okay? Um, and then two years later, we actually computed what, what that finite non-zero constant was and um, I don't know. It's 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 really it's really kind of amazing that we can get such a precise result uh, for the um, the upper order of torsion points on CM elliptic curve. So this is a good result to sort of keep in mind and also to compare against the non-CM case. And so now uh, this is still Florian Breuer. This is a sharper statement of Breuer's work than. Um, I gave you before, it's still not the sharpest possible statement, but you see, by the way, that the lower bound, the fact that this limb soup was finite is already due to Florian Breuer. Earlier, I had it without the CM, and it's a stronger, because TCM of D is certainly less than or equal to uh, T of D, this, is, this first uh, result is definitely an improvement over what I said before. Right. So not how do we know that um, the limb soup of T of D over uh, D log log D is positive because we know that even for TCM of D, which could be smaller. But then Breuer also has results which address the not CM case. And what's interesting is, look, the the result, the, the thing that that we're dividing by is not D log log D anymore. It's not even bigger than D log log D. It's smaller. Right, so this is like d to the one plus epsilon. This is like d to the one half plus epsilon. Okay, and so um, and again, you can ask your so this this is interesting, right? So Breuer's result was first before this these results of Paul and, and I. So what Paul and I proved is that this first upper bound is actually the truth. Not only is it positive, but it's also finite. So I've sort of set it up to kind of make you wonder maybe this limb soup is also finite as well in which case the true upper order of T not CM of D would be square root of D log log D. Do I think that that's true? I think it makes as much sense to imagine that that's true as anything else. It certainly might not be true. What would prevent that from being true? As you range over the modular curves X1, M comma N for all M and N, there would need to be infinitely many uh, non-cuspidal, non-CM points of degrees smaller than the degrees that we can produce uh, on these curves. So of course that could happen, but somehow it would be even easier for that not to happen. Okay, so the, there's a sense in which it's plausible that this limb soup is, is finite, but I'm not, you know, maybe certainly might not be. But it would be very interesting if it were, because that would, that would show that the upper order of TCM of D being D log log D would actually be significantly greater than the upper order of T not CM of D. And that would imply that although for the three values we looked at, 
uh, T of D was equal to T naught CM of D, which was bigger than T CM of D. In fact, for infinitely often, T of D would be given only by T CM of D and would be much larger than T naught CM of D. But the story is even more complicated than that. I'll, I'll tell it a bit, a bit quickly. Um, for the lower order, it's, it's this, this is actually not that hard to prove just by looking at um, rational functions on x1 of n is how you prove this. The lim inf of t naught cm of d divided by square root d is positive. So, so in other words, um, for all sufficiently large d, you can produce torsion points on non-cm elliptic curves uh, of, of, of a constant, a fixed constant times the square root of the degree. Okay, so t naught cm of d is always at least um, square root of d, uh, whereas there's this, this funny, uh, Anatomy of Torsion paper uh, with Abby Bourdon and Paul Pollock, which contains some results that I don't have time to talk about. But if you put these two things together, you find the following conclusion: for most d in this, you know, in the sense of density, so the there is a density one set of positive integers for which t of d is given by not, by um, the largest size of the torsion subgroup in degree d is only given by an elliptic curve without complex. Okay, so this is the end of my discussion of the asymptotic behavior of T of D, but it's, it's actually pretty interesting. So it, it's definitely true that T of D is realized only by not CM elliptic curves um, most of the time, but it's quite conceivable that for a density zero but infinite set of Ds, the, um, the, the T of D is realized only by a CM elliptic curve. And along that very small set of Ds, the size of the torsion subgroup is much larger than it is in the non cm case. OK, so that's, that's the end of that. So that's an interesting interaction between uh, complex multiplication and non-complex multiplication. So now I want to transition to the problem of computing uh, Cal T CM of D. So in other words, if you give me a positive integer D, I would like to give you back the full set of torsion subgroups of CM elliptic curves uh, in degree D. Okay, so I call this almost solved, whatever that means. We're, you know, we're, we've done a lot of good work on it. So this is essentially the same problem as computing degrees of CM points on X1 of M comma N. This came up very briefly. Uh, I'll show you a little bit more about it in a second, but this is a modular curve. Um, you know, if, if M is equal to N, then this would be the modular curve that parameterizes elliptic curves with full N torsion. And so this is a bit more general. It parameterizes, if M divides N, this parameterizes elliptic curves with Z mod M cross Z mod N inside their torsion. So again, this is a little bit rough. Um, but what is this delta CM that I, I need to and can define? So to any imaginary quadratic order, in fact, to any order in a number field, you can define a, def uh, a discriminant in lots of ways. I eventually realized the fastest way to say it is you probably know what the discriminant of the ring of integers is. That's the discriminant of the number field. And again, the order is just a finite index subring of, okay, the full ring of integers of the number field. So the discriminant of the non-maximal order is the discriminant of the maximal order, which you already know what it is, times the square of the index. Okay, you know, other, other very reasonable definitions. Uh, so this, this has to be a negative integer that is zero or one modulo four. I believe the discriminant of any order in any number field has to be zero or one modulo four. Um, conversely, it's very easy to just write down all possible imaginary quadratic orders. Um, so you find that every integer that is 0 or 1 mod 4 is the discriminant of an imaginary quadratic order and a unique one up to isomorphism. So what's the upshot of this? We're trying to parameterize all the possible endomorphism rings of CM elliptic curves. The first thing we said is that that's the same as all imaginary quadratic orders. And now I'm saying that that's also in bijection with just negative integers delta that are zero or one mod four. So that's, that's very concrete, okay? So just by ranging over these delta, I'm ranging over the possible endomorphism rings. And now a classical construction. Um, uh, there's this Hilbert, this thing called the Hilbert class polynomial. What is this? This is the, um, the monic square free polynomial whose complex roots are the J invariants of elliptic curves whose endomorphism ring has discriminant delta. By saying that, I'm telling you there are finitely many such J invariants. 
This polynomial is irreducible over Q. That's saying that the J invariants form one uh, complete Galois orbit. It's also irreducible over K. And the degree of this polynomial, in other words, the number of delta CMJ invariants is uh, the class number of the order. Okay, so now I can set this up in an arithmetic geometric way. And if you guys missed you know, the old times where people write on the board with their bad handwriting, then, then here it is. You get the in-person, a glimpse of the in-person experience. Um, first of all, I'm giving you a family of closed points on the bottom modular curve X of one. So X of one, so this is the J line. X of one is, is just the affine line together with the point at infinity that corresponds to a cusp. So um, y of one, the literally is the affine line over Q. Well, that's an affine curve whose affine coordinate ring is, is the polynomial ring Q bracket T. Therefore, to give a closed point on y of one, I should be giving you a maximal ideal in this polynomial ring. Therefore, I should be giving you a monic irreducible polynomial. Okay, so closed points on y of one correspond to monic irreducible polynomials with coefficients in Q. What luck for every delta that is negative and congruent to zero or one mod four, I gave you such a monic irreducible polynomial. So that gives me a closed point J delta uh, on uh, y of one and therefore on X of one. And so the idea, this is not necessarily a Q rational point only for 13 values of delta is it, is it a Q rational point, but it's always a closed point um, whose degree is equal to uh, the class number. So geometrically, this corresponds to the full Galois conjugacy class of CMJ invariants uh, for a fixed, um, fixed uh, order. Okay, so I have a closed point downstairs, and now what I'm interested in doing is understanding how my closed point pulls back uh, in this tower of curves. Okay, so now I have this curve. So cover up the left-hand stuff for a second. This straight up and down thing maybe will be more familiar. So we have this principal modular curve X of N. Uh, if you wanna see a really nice elementary construction of X of N, I highly recommend an article by David Warlick. He really, he really nails it. Um, and so X of N can be constructed via the Galois theory of function fields, essentially. It is a Galois cover of X of one with Galois group GL2 Z mod NZ modulo plus minus one. Okay, and then uh, these ones are sort of familiar. You have X naught of N, which is parameterizing elliptic curves with a cyclic N isogeny. You have X one of N, which is parameterizing elliptic curves with a point of order N. Neither X naught of N nor X one of N are Galois over X of one, like X N is. By the way, be, by, just by Galois theory, and by the correspondence between curves and function fields, in order to tell you, in order to define any of these intermediate curves, all I have to do is give you a subgroup of GL2 Z mod NZ that contains plus minus one. I'm not, I'm not spending the time to tell you exactly what these subgroups are, but you know, I certainly could. Okay. So uh, X naught of N and X one of N are not Galois coverings of, of X of one. That makes them more complicated in some ways. However, X one of N is Galois and even abelian over X naught of N for good reasons. And the Galois group is Z mod N Z star modulo plus minus one. So that, that right-hand side is pretty standard, but I'm not just interested in a point of order N, I'm interested in all possible torsion subgroups. Every torsion subgroup of an elliptic curve over a number field is of the form Z mod M cross Z mod N. So that makes me interested in this X one of MN that I was talking about before, which is parameterizing precisely those structures. Now comes a curve that you may not have seen before. In fact, I would love for someone watching this to tell me where they've seen this curve in the literature, because I haven't seen it yet, but it must, must be there somewhere. This one is an isogeny version of X1 of N. Indeed, if you take M equals one here and here, then you get, you get back down here. So what is it parameterizing? Um, it has two independent cyclic M isogenies where independent means the corresponding subgroups generate the full M torsion, and then it has a cyclic N isogeny. And again, uh, you, it's, it's not mysterious. There's just a certain subgroup of GL2. If you know what subgroup of GL2 Z mod NZ defines the X1 guy, you can probably figure out which subgroup defines the X naught guy. It's nothing, it's nothing crazy. And again, we have a, a Z mod NZ star uh, mod plus minus one. Okay, and so the, the idea here is that I have a, um, 
a closed point downstairs. I have a whole tower of curves, and I'm very interested in how these CM points uh, pull back in this tower. So I could say, I could say I have a divisor downstairs, and I'm trying to pull back my divisor. That would be a, a geometric way of saying it. Um, I could also say it totally in the language of algebraic number theory, by the way, and I want to sort of emphasize that you can say it that way. This, this is not an analogy to algebraic number theory. This is literally algebraic number theory uh, because these are all nice projective curves. We, we may as well remove the point in infinity and all the pre-images. If we remove all the cusps, then we have um, affine curves whose affine coordinate rings are Dedekind domains. And so we have a prime ideal in our downstairs Dedekind domain, uh, which is Q of T. And then what am I? What I'm asking is literally the problem of how a prime ideal splits in a finite extension of Dedekind domains, which is the classic problem in algebraic number theory one. And so we want to know the usual algebraic number theory one stuff. We'd like to know the ramification indices. We'd like to know the number of places. So I have this place J delta downstairs in each one of these curves. I'd like to know how many points I have upstairs lying over this this one place downstairs. I'd like to know the degree of each place. So as usual in algebraic number theory, every every uh, prime ideal in the Dedekind domain has a residue field. If you have a downstairs prime ideal and then an upstairs prime ideal, the residue field of the upstairs prime ideal is a finite degree extension of the residue field of the downstairs prime ideal. That's the FI. So all that's completely standard. This sort of extra credit quantity here is the residue field itself. Okay, so I'm putting that in orange uh, to indicate it. So what's, what's the idea? If you were in the classical case of the Dedekind domains just being rings of integers of number fields, then the residue fields would be finite. And if you tell me the degree of a finite field over another known finite field, then that tells me what the finite field is up to isomorphism. But if you tell me the degree of a number field over another known number field, unless that degree is one, that doesn't tell me what the number field is. That's the one sense in which this is a little bit more complicated. So somehow the orange extra credit is if we could actually determine um, what these residue fields are rather than just their degree. Okay, and so I'm gonna sort of deal with the ramification first of all, mostly by dismissing it. So um, even X of N down to X of one, hence everything below it, can only ramify over 0, 17, 28, and infinity. It's a well-known classical result. Uh, infinity is great. That doesn't correspond to elliptic curve anyway. 0 and 17, 28, that's bad news for us. These definitely are class number one CMJ invariants. They correspond to delta equals minus three, delta equals minus four. These two might be your favorite uh, CMJ invariants. They have long since become my least favorite. CMJ invariants. They really are exceptional. So I'm just going to exclude them. And now I have unram now I have no ramification. And so this result is I'm solving the splitting problem for the best curve for, from X of one up into X of N. And now I've given myself an unramified Galois extension. So that's great. If you think it through, all the residue fields have to be isomorphic because it's a Galois extension. There's no ramification. So if you just tell me what any one residue field is, that'll determine everything else, okay? And so this result is a reframing of a result with uh, Abby Bourdain that was published in the first of our uh, two recent papers. Um, Abby and I were working on the Galois representation side. That's how we proved this result. And I think it's interesting that you can rephrase our result in terms of this uh, splitting problem for modular curves. Okay, and so I'm doing this. It's a little more specific than we need, but the general case is n is at least three or the discriminant is odd. In that case, the, um, the residue field of any delta CM point on X of n, okay, full n torsion, is the compositum of this field. So this is what's called a ring class field. This, this field would be, you take the Hilbert, poly, Hilbert class polynomial, not for delta, but for n squared delta. It's still irreducible over k. I made sure to tell you that. And so you would join a root. You get that field that's called, that's a ring class field. And this is, this is the, the N ray class field of K uh, in the sense of uh, usual sense of class field theory. So that's what the field is. It's the compositum of a ring class field and a ray class field. Evidently it's an abelian extension of K. So evidently it contains K. I also know what the degree of this field is, okay? 
So that's great. And then there's this kind of exceptional case when n is equal to two. I, I'm not going to use this piece of information. Uh, it's mildly of note that in the, the, only in this exceptional case does the residue field not contain the imaginary quadratic field if we're going all the way up to x of n. And the point here is that um, if you were to further specialize this result from delta to delta k, a fundamental discriminant, discriminant of the maximal order, then this would be giving you a big special case of the classical first main theorem of complex multiplication. You could get this result to tell you that if you take, if you adjoin to k the Weber function of the n-torsion of any OKCM elliptic curve, then you get the n-ray class field. Okay, so that's just a very, very important result in the classical theory of elliptic curves. And so if the easiest special case of the splitting problem returns the main theorem of complex multiplication, then the splitting problem is probably pretty good. Okay, so uh, I am coming to the towards the end here. Um, in my recent work using isogeny volcanoes, I gave a talk on this almost a year ago. I'm solving the splitting problem for the isogeny curves x naught of m comma n when m equals one and m equals two, unfortunately not when the CM field is, is Q adjoined minus three or Q adjoined minus four, that's a problem. And I'm just, it's much more specific than this. I'm just giving you an idea. Uh, I do everything. I do the orange thing as well. I get the residue fields and every residue field is either Q adjoined a root of a certain Hilbert class polynomial, which I call a rational ring class field or K adjoined a root of a certain Hilbert class polynomial. But this N is allowed to vary and these extensions are not Galois over Q. So the residue fields don't, don't all need to be the same. In fact, you can have arbitrarily many different residue fields of delta CM points on one of these curves. Um, why am I restricting to M equals one and two? Um, in principle, you could do any N, at least any M, at least one at a time. It, it gets complicated though. So um, the matter of it is to deal with the case of a prime power. And so I was very dogged for any delta satisfying this proviso and any prime power, I really wanted to write down all of the delta CM points on X naught P to the A with their multiplicities, with their residue fields. I did it. I recorded it in 95 tables. So that's kind of a lot. Um, I think that someone who's kind of better at this casework and detail-oriented mathematics might do a better job than, than, than I am. So I'm not trying to say that it's hopeless to do X naught of MN for general M, but um, it, it was the, the, the full splitting problem was more than I wanted to do. Also, the payoff is much less. So it turns out that for M greater than or equal to three, again, if you have full M torsion when M is at least three, that forces your ground field to contain the CM field K. And then prior work with Abby Bourdain doesn't solve the splitting problem in this very, very um, demanding sense that I've, that I've explained it right now, but gives you enough information to compute the Cal, Cal T CM of D. Okay, so now the last thing that I have to explain and then I'll and then I'll uh, I'll stop. Is um, why am I working on x naught of m n the isogeny curve? I was saying that in order to compute torsion subgroups of CM elliptic curves, I should be looking at degrees of CM points on x one of m n. And this is a little bit weird because in the non CM case, classifying rational points on x naught of n is much harder than classifying um, rational points on x one of n. I, um, so you could rephrase Mordell's theorem by saying the least degree of a non-cuspidal point on X1 of N goes to infinity with N. And then you could state a corresponding version isogeny Mordell statement on X naught of N. I think Aiken Osman was, was doing this or something close to it in her talk. And that would be the least degree of a non-cuspidal, non-CM, you, know, you now have to say, a point on X naught of N should go to infinity uh, with N. But that's wide open. It's, it seems incredibly hard. And now uh, in the CM case, though, things are a lot better. I already showed you this map from the X1 curve down to the X0 curve. And this is a result of mine, but it builds very closely on prior work with Abby Bourdain. As long as delta is less than minus four, this map is inert over every delta CM point downstairs. Inert means the usual thing. It means there's no ramification and there's exactly one upstairs place lying over every downstairs place. And therefore the only thing that, that's happening is that the residual degree is growing by the degree of the cover. 
And so that allows us to, we have the full splitting problem over X naught of M, including the bonus orange thing where we actually have the residue fields. And now when we go from X naught of M to X one of M, it's inert. So I know exactly how many points I, I have down here. I have the same number, it's, it's fully inert. And also because it's fully inert, the degree upstairs is always equal to the degree downstairs times the degree of the cover. That's also what inert means. And the degree of the cover is phi of n over two. The only thing that I lose is I knew what the field was downstairs and I don't know what the field is upstairs. I only know the degree. On the other hand, I don't need to know the field. It's interesting to know the field, but really if you're trying to classify torsion subgroups, you want to know the degrees of closed CM points on x1 of m comma n. And this work will let you do that as long as you stay away from um, q square root minus one and q square root minus three. And that brings me to the end of my talk. I, I, there, there is some further work to be done. So if you wanted to ask questions about any of these further topics, feel free. It's also okay if you don't, I will end here. Thank you. Great, thanks Pete. Uh, so any questions here? Well, maybe I'll start with one. Uh, so do you have a conjecture about the structure of the a uh, torsion subgroup that realizes the largest size for various D? Uh, I mean, I certainly don't in the not CM case because who knows? Um, in the CM case, we should have some information about that. Yeah, I mean, okay, the way that um, I can tell you how Breuer does it, which I think is the best that we know, okay? Um, the way that Breuer does it, where did I, where did I go here? I actually cut this for time. I had a more precise result. What he actually does is um, he fixes one elliptic curve over a number field and then figures out how big is the torsion subgroup over various extensions of, of that number field. Okay, and that's basically the same as fixing the J invariant. Um, and in that case, and even there you get you get these um, you, you get these bounds. And the way to do that is to um, uh, you take the first n prime numbers, and you um, and you trip and you give yourself full p1 torsion, full p2 torsion, all the way up to full p n torsion. So, and I think that is, um, yeah. So the, this this comes up a little bit in, in, a, in a paper with uh, Paul Pollock. That is, um, if you're just trying to produce the largest torsion subgroup in degree d that you can, that's that's the best that we know how to do. So this is going to be a group which is the torsion subgroup is going to be sort of square in the sense that it's going to be Z modulo, the product of the first N prime numbers cross Z modulo, the product of the first N prime numbers. But um, whether that um, um, in the CM case, there's a little bit of there's an interesting kind of tension between the exponent of the group and um, the size of the group. So actually a prior prior work of Alice Silverberg, who I think may be here. Uh, gave this optimal bound on the exponent of the torsion subgroup uh, in the CM case. And okay, you square it, and, and that gives you a bound on the entire torsion subgroup. But it turns out that, but that would give you d log log d, the quantity squared, which is too big. Okay, mm -hmm. and so, um, yeah, so there, there's an interesting kind of tension between the exponent of the torsion subgroup and the entire size of the torsion subgroup. I've actually discussed this with Paul. I think. I think if you only if you only looked at the exponent instead of the order, it would be small in the CM case. It would be smaller than d log log d, but not by that much. Mm. Great. Let's see other questions. Looks like uh, Nils Nils Brown has, has raised. Okay. Hi Pete. Nice talk. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Um, at uh, uh, one question about the tension between the CM and the non-CM yeah. is, as, as we know, the Galois representations of CM curves are a lot smaller than those of yes. normal uh, general curves in, in, in general. Yeah. And hence, you would expect that point stabilizers for particular n-torsion 
uh, t tend to be a little bit smaller in them, right? So that's what you're giving is really the, ex the the explanation for the square root here. Yeah, that's exactly right. So this this is the the ingredient in this result okay. is Sarah's open image theorem. Yeah, the okay. CM case versus the non CM case. So yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. Okay, and so, so by the way, the the work that with most the work that's just with Abby Bourdon was entirely on the Galois representation in the CM case. There's other people. I think I saw Ricardo Pengo in the in the audience. And so he has a recent paper which does um, some really nice stuff on the Galois representation in the CM case. Also Alvaro Lozano Robledo has a nice, very nice paper on the Galois representation. And so um, yeah, no, the Galois representation in the CM case is not only very different, it's the target group is uh, this uh, Adelic Carton group, which is kind of two-dimensional rather than four-dimensional as a Lie group, um, it really turns out to be so much simpler. It kind of, um, it, it's it's kind of as large as it could possibly be up to a twist in every single case, mm -hmm. whereas the whole game, surely this is part of what Jeremy is going to be talking about. Um, yeah, so there's there's just the, there's a much, the Sarah's open index theorem holds in a much, much stronger form uh, in the CM case, uh, whereas that it should hold you, you know, uni uniform SARE is like one of the holy grails in the, in the non. -sare. Yeah. But yeah. There's a it's what, it, what it was going to. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. Go onwards uh, to as well is that so, okay, so that sort of gives you that per CM curve, you sort of expect a little bit more torsion over already smaller fields. Yeah. On the other hand, there's way more non CM curves. No, you're exactly from right. From a statistical if, 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 point of view, it, it, it would seem that you can play a game against those two and sort of give you an expectation of what, what should be the case. I, I think that what you said is, I mean, is, is definitely exactly right. If you do it one curve at a time, then the CM case is always going to win. That's, mm -hmm. that's what this result is saying. But you're, of course, you're exactly right. Um, there are so many more. You have geometric families of, you know, of non-CM non curves, but... Um, um, Anyway, well, yes, I, I I agree with what you're saying, and so, um, <laughs> just of, of course, of course, the what am I trying to say? Like, there could be all these undreamt of phenomena in the in the non CM case that are you know producing, um, you know, but basically the only the bounds that I'm giving you on the non CM case are coming from trivializing the mod n Galois representation on a fixed curve. Of course, there could be something that's better than that. There are lots of things. There are finitely many known things that are finitely better than that. Sure, there are. Or are there infinitely many things that are infinitely better than that? That's the question. Great. Let's see. And uh, Adam, do you want to ask a question? Yeah. So I was just wondering. So in this result that you had with Pollock from 2017 about the elliptic curves with J invariant in Q, um, yes. if you replace Q by some other number field, can you prove a similar result? Or or if not, yeah, why thank, do you thank you for asking. If you fix the number field, then we have a conditional result. So this this is a you know you can you can see our this is a, it's called um, pursuing polynomial bounds on torsion. It's a 2017 mm -hmm. paper. Uh, so let, let me think. Um, so you can do that if you assume that your number field does not contain like the Hilbert class field of any imaginary quadratic field. And if you assume the generalized Riemann hypothesis, unfortunately. So yeah, there is a, there is a conditional result where you replace Q um, with any fixed number field. Yeah. Thank you. Which is of course still a major limitation. Wonderful. 